progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open up the word of the Lord today, shall we seek his guidance to see what this chapter has for us and says to us for this time in earth's history? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we recognize that there is nothing unimportant in scripture. We recognize that everything is inspired, that everything is here for a reason, that it is to our detriment to set aside portions of scripture as if they were not inspired. Help us today as we open this portion of the book of Judges to understand the history that has gone before as light for our paths today. Place us so that we may be able to understand, direct us, so that we may be willing to understand, guide us, so that we are able to make use of this understanding so that your character may be perfected within us and shown to all with whom we come in contact. Be with us now. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we've covered the last few days. As we continue through this portion of the book of Judges. We have established that the judge for the time of the children of Israel is a message for our time. So it is up to us to determine through collaborative study and discussion what we are looking for in the message of the judges that have followed. Now, one of the points that we're dealing with, we could safely place the latter chapters of Judges as occurring about the time of Othmael, possibly into Ahud, but I would see it within this portion with Othmael. We're not going to touch on those yet today. We're going to go into this on the study of Ahud because we need to determine what the message is that Ahud is presenting for us. So as we open this in Judges 3, verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, when we're looking at this, we're given Judges 2.19 and 1 Samuel 12.9 as cross-references. 219, of course, will follow what we're dealing with here. And it says, and it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. 
What does that say to us today? What is this portion from this prior chapter? That they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn ways. In this portion of Judges, are they not, is it not saying to us that we cannot afford any other method of study outside of that outlined by Father Miller? That we cannot afford to accept any other doctrine, any other interpretation than that which is shown by line upon line. Yeah, and, and it also shows that that we have some of our own ways, our own doings, that we are persistent in, persistent in um, that we're unwilling to give up. So there are things that we understand that are errors that need to be corrected. Because I mean, I'm looking at this mostly from from the context of how we're dealing with this as a message. So, you know, one of the things that we, we could say when, when the December 6th declaration was, was written and published, I mean, it was just an example of this. They, they, they basically were not willing to be taught by God. And they had to stick to their their stubborn way they to just never learn from the experience of july 18th and and of course this is talking about us right so we know that we're no different okay <clears throat> anybody else any other perspective on this Uh, I had I had mentioned that uh, Eglon's name means a steer or a bullock, which immediately made me think of Jeroboam II's setup of the of the bulls, the bull gods, the like idols in Dan and well, right throughout Dan and Beersheba, I guess, and also also the golden calf, you know, when when Moses and Aaron were supposed to be ruling. Uh, guiding the people to be ruled by God, rather. And I think that, the, yeah, there are a lot of idols. Like the Lord is <clears throat> spotlighting a lot of my problems, and he's also revealing things to me in the course that I should be taking. Like he doesn't repent without that, uh, that bomb that he gives you, right, to heal you. And I'm so thankful for that because I'm beginning to see things a little more clearly. Like I was telling somebody this morning that, this is like my path most where I am now because there's nobody around here that I can really share the word of God with. They're not interested. They're, they, they don't want the advancing light. So what do I do? I have to look right up right up to heaven and get it there. And then I, I read and I put in my presentation for next, not this Sabbath, but the next one that, that John had received most of his revelations more than he had received beforehand when he was on Patmos. And I thought, well, this is my Patmos. Now, currently, this is my Patmos. So I should be receiving more revelations. I should be growing more here, even though it's a fiery trial. I'm telling you, I don't, I'm not enjoying it here. But I mean, in the flesh, it's really hard, you know, but in the spirit, the Lord is going to open up more as I repent more and more. And as I'm willing to hear and be corrected, and that's the key because, I mean, I crave heaven. I crave the character of Christ. And it's too much suffering that we are going to attain it. It's dying to self. And we keep having to relearn that. Okay. <clears throat> so as we are looking at this, if we take this definition, that Eglon being a bullock, but we're talking about a bullock of Moab. Bullock 
of that which has come due to incest through a, an improper relationship. This would seem to set the tone for this example. Yeah, so, so, so it represents something in our movement, some kind of rebellion in our movement, and then we're going to have an answer to that rebellion. So, so you know, we, we haven't really placed these as specific messages, um, but we can see at least the general sense here that this is a message, an error that is tied to... Uh, well, if we just look at it and taking these symbols, this incestuous relationship, so that's symbolic. And then we have, it's the king of Eglon, who, who's uh, Catholic. Why? So, why, why what? Why Catholic? Because that calf, calf. Calf-like. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what my my dif dictionary says here. It means Catholic. Um, so, and from the word ego, which means a male calf, especially one that's about a year old or nearly what? grown, a bullock or a calf. That's what the word eggle means. But eglon means like a calf. Okay. So. So, so there's something that's calf-like, that, so in a symbolic sense, and then it's incestuous in a, a symbolic sense. Um, that's where this error comes from. And then the answer to that, of course, um, there's lots of symbolism here. So, uh, you know, I'm just wondering whether we can nail this down as some specific doctrine, teaching, or message within this movement that is one of the nations, one of the messages that God has allowed to continue because it wasn't addressed. So, so we know the first one, Othniel, is, is dealing with a, um, a double evil, right? Um, that is, um, and we had addressed that as what specifically, what was the, the double evil that the Holy Spirit is corrected us of, or is to correct us of. Anybody remember? We were holding on to sins. We were unwilling to repent. Yeah. yeah and there was a verse we used. I, I just can't remember the verse. Was, uh, it was Jeremiah two thirteen. Yeah which says says what would you read that about hewing out broken cisterns ah. and hold no yeah so they committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewed out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water and we usually use this verse in context of education that is it's the wrong system of study, right? Correct. And then the living waters, rejecting the living waters, what would the waters represent? Well, the living waters, does that not represent what Christ has offered for us? Right. So, so this is your basic thing of salvation. The Holy Spirit um, has been, you know, given to us through Christ, this living waters, this truth that we can drink and we will never thirst. That's been rejected. So this has to do with, with on, on one level, just how we understand truth. And the only way that we can be corrected is through Othniel, which is the Holy Spirit in this symbolic res representation. So then when we have um, uh, this next thing, so 
we have this this now this cath like Moabite um, oppression. Um, we're going to be um, delivered, and it says, well, I mean, I'm getting ahead of things, but he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So we're going to, we know that that represents Jericho, and Jericho represents the seven times. So there's something about this message, this error, that the seven times addresses. <clears throat> Or is it that there is something about this message that is addressed against the seven times? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So against the seven times, yes. So the situation that that I'm having to return to mm -hmm. this Eglon of Moab. Mm -hmm. This Estuous sacrifice then chooses to gather unto him the children of Ammon. This is the other children of incest yeah. and of Amalek. There is three here. So is this not a representation of a threefold union? Yeah. Now, the first message that we were addressing we have the need of repentance, which is our first step into the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Could this with Ahud against this incestuous message of a threefold union be a representation of the second angel's message of Revelation 14. Well, it is, but actually all of this period of the judges is the second angel's message of Revelation 14. <clears throat> but as we've already established you can't have a second message without having a first message no well, i understand that yeah okay yeah. i'm just i'm wondering if this is not being presented in quite a bit more detail for us at this time yeah. so that we can understand the fact that what elder jeff was doing was giving us a structure to be able to understand the lessons that are being taught in this particular book. Because as we look at this, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So this is, this is something where they are going against the seven times. Yeah. Right, so they've been attacking the seven times, which okay. to me, which to me is part of the attack against the chronology in general. Um, you know what I what what I think of is I think of 2015, my paper on the 2520, and the way that it was attacked. But actually, all through this, the time that I've been in this message, the chronology has been attacked, and that is we had all this light addressing something we already accepted as truth, the 2520, and there was such a resistance to anything that that was supporting the 2520. Um, that's the thing that I see here. So I would think it refers to a specific teaching in opposition to the 2520. So in this, we're given a message, we're given a, a verse that says, so the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Yeah. Is this a symbolic representation of the time period from September 11, 2001 unto to November 9th, 2019?
Yeah, well, definitely it uh, it could be. Now, I note from the chat that we have a comment. And it gives us reference that it gives a reference to Isaiah 8, 6, and 7. For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly, and rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah's son, therefore behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over his channels and go over all of his banks. Yeah, so they, they reject this water. <clears throat> right. And and also in this chapter, uh, which is talking about Assyria coming in, they're going to have this uh, this son who's going to be born named Ma Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Um, so it's quite a mouthful there. But the thing that's interesting here is in 8 verse 1, it says, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it, write in it, in it with a man's pen concerning Mahershala Hashbaz. And that role there is actually a mirror. It's a tablet for writing by analogy a mirror as a plate. So this mirror, of course, is addressing the 2520 if you go on and read all about it. So um, so we can see we have the same, same thing again, uh, just in another symbol dealing with the waters themselves. Okay. Now, Father Miller would have applied waters as being people. Yeah, well, in this context, you couldn't. Right. We're looking at this as being waters more as a message. Yeah. But what we're looking at here <clears throat> within Judges We have this threefold union that is against the 2520. Mm -hmm. Now, those that are represented by Moab, by Ammon, and by Amalek are giving a representation of those that have chosen not to accept God's leadership. Mm -hmm. And and this if this is a threefold union, this represents different powers or different groups that basically in our movement, or maybe even on the borders of our movement, have been opposing the truth, um, the light that's been coming to this movement. Okay. So the first thing, of course, that they, they reject is obviously um, the work of the Holy Spirit. But now, even though they get that deliverance from Othniel, which is going to continue, because remember, these aren't successive. These these all run consecutively, or not consecutive. Um, they all run at one concurrently. At, uh, concurrently. That's the word. Yes, concurrently. So you have one follow the other, but they all continue to 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 be the message. So this is a a, a meth message that that builds and adds layers to it. Okay. But and as you accept each of these messages, um, you don't continue, you don't reject that, that message that came before. So they all um, combine together. All right. I understand that they're combined together, but I think that they are more consecutive messages. Right. So they happen, they start at different times. Okay. Because right. concurrently, but, but, what I, but what I mean is they, they start at different times, but they still continue. That's what I'm trying to say. That is, the, the first message doesn't end and then the second begin. Okay. They, build, they build on each other, is what I'm trying to say. So you have a group of people that's really not, not accepted the message. And, and yet they're still in the movement and they're going to be opposing the light that's coming. So they profess to believe the 2520. They're going to possess it, right? The city of palm trees. 
and yet they're opposed to the light that's coming uh, regarding that message. Okay. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. <clears throat> this is one of these verses that the translators used, another verse, as an example. So in Judges 20, if we recall that when Benjamin was called to defend the decisions that had been made that were so similar to Sodom and Gomorrah, we are being told that among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hair's breadth and not miss. Now the alternate reading would be as this, but when the children of Israel of Gemini, a man shut off of his right hand, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Why would they see this as being a man shut off of his right hand? Okay, so so we know Benjamite a Benjamite is a Benjamin is the son of the right hand. Right. Right. But this man's left handed, which is really interesting that they mention that he's a Benjamite, a son of the right hand, but he's left handed. I'm not sure what this is this kind of like um, something to do with the structure of the lines? Please explain. Well, because the left and the right, these <coughs> they come together as, as a chiasm. All right. It could be. I mean, we, we have a later explanation in Judges 20 about 700 men that were left-handed. Yeah. But are they Benjamites? No, they're... Okay. Is that the thing I find interesting, that he's a Benjamite who's left-handed? Right. right. <laughs> yes, I think they are Benjamites. Uh, they are? Yes. So you got all these Benjamites, the sons of the right hand, who are all left-handed. So, okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, because it is representing a chiasm. But why, why would they say that he was shut off of his right hand? Well, because, um, so they're translating this here. Um, because that's the way that it's it's left-handed. So in the Hebrew, it's got the word iter, which means impeded or shut up. And then it says yad, which is hand. And then it says uh, right hand, right? So, so to be left-handed means that your right hand can't be used, right? Because you're, you're obviously impeded in your right hand. That's the only reason you're left-handed. Okay. That's just how they described left-handed. Uh... Now, 
when it says Ahud, the son of Gera, the son of Gemini. What's important about this being a son of Gemini? Son of Gemini? I, I, I don't understand where you're getting this from. That's the alternate reading. Oh, that's okay. So there, why Gemini? I mean, it's a Benjamite son of, so, so they're just count translating Benjamin as son of Gemini. That's an odd way to translate it. <clears throat> I mean, literally, that's how you would say Yemeni, right? So, so they're just saying the son of the right hand, but I don't know why they would translate it as Gemini instead of just translating it as right hand because gemini uh, doesn't mean anything H how are they spelling gemini just the way i presented it before you okay where is this here okay yeah which gemini is the twins so that doesn't make any sense why they're doing that Unless we can say it's a it's it's a reference to Donald Trump's birth sign, something to do with Donald Trump. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Also, on, uh, it's not Gemini. Five thirty. <laughs> those words have Pardon no. Me? Th those words have no connection whatsoever. Uh, the the okay. Hebrew word here, which they're translating as uh, Gemini has no relationship to the word Gemini. Like there, there's no etymological connection or even definitional connection. So I have no idea why they translated it as Gemini. That's just really how weird. About Matthew, how about Matthew 5.30? And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. That to me is a hard saying, like what, like physically, especially, and spiritually, like I've always puzzled what exactly was Jesus talking about? I don't. I just thought maybe because it mentioned the right, the right hand has been discarded. So is it some horrible sin, some horrible, Thing that we are doing that we need to be aware of and get rid of so we can progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ehud's the son of Gira, which is uh, reference to grain, uh, a son of the right hand. Yeah, I just really puzzled why they would translate it as Gemini. I mean, that's that's a, a you know a Latin word, or I mean that refers to the twins in the constant has no no connection to the right hand. So, could uh, Ehud have been amongst them seven hundred? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question um, because chapter twenty we know is happening her early at this time, so it actually goes back to this earlier period. Um, yeah. And it can't be just that he's got a crippled right hand, because I don't think all these Benjamites, these 700 Benjamites who are left handed, have, you know, all just somehow damaged their right hand. They are left handed. So. Okay, so as we're establishing this, the Lord raises up a huge. Now, if you're left handed, you're going to be more versed in using a hand that is opposite to the majority of people. Mm -hmm. but Ahud made him a dagger which had two edges 
of a cubit length. <clears throat> and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. Okay, so one thing we have here, cubit here would be 18 inches, right? Right. And we already have the 18 years. Right. Um, we have this left and right-handed thing going on. Right. We have a two-edged sword, which would represent God's word, but it also can represent the lines. Okay. <clears throat> So wouldn't this 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 message be about the structure of prophetic chronology? Wouldn't it have to be? Yeah. But it's how it's being delivered, I think, is the the major thing because as we go mm -hmm. into this story it's delivered in a very unexpected way. And we have a couple of witnesses to that. Mm -hmm. And he brought the present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. Now in the Hebrew, how would you be translating this as being very fat? Well, it's plump, uh, plenteous. fleshed, fatted, or plumped. Um, and the word miod, which is the one that's very fat, um, is uh, holy fat, I guess. It's kind of like a completeness. All right. <clears throat> so this would be one that is extremely self-satisfied, extremely self-sufficient. He's not fearing much, therefore, he is willing to indulge in what he sees as being the best of the best and is not fearing many. Mm -hmm. Could we read uh, Jeremiah 5, 20, 25 through 31? I, I'll read it for you. It says, Please. your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie wait as he that set the snares. They set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat. This is verse 28. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Like the first verse that came to me, of course, was 528. They're waxen fat. They shine a lot. Okay. Eglon, you know, waxen fat, really fat, corpulent. And being like somebody who's so content with what he or she has already learned, whether it's false or true, and has closed his or her heart to receiving anything new from the Lord, which would prosper that person spiritually, simply because he or she does not like the 
the teacher's personality. Sorry, but that's how I feel. Yeah, well, and, and part of this too, so just looking what you, you've said, um, if we look at this in the context of those who possess the 2520, I would look at this earlier in our um, line here. That is that group that came in with the 2520 for the most part, that would be, uh, you know, Jamal and Emiliano and Kevin Howard and, and these different people. Um, and this to me would describe their message and their resistance to any of this light. And, and there were still lots of those people, even after they left, who were still in the movement, um, who were mostly interested in the 2520. And yet when any light came regarding the 2520, they rejected it. They, they resisted any light that was coming that could have helped them. So is this with what we're applying with these parts that were formerly of the movement, are these the representation of Eglon or are these more representation of Moab, Ammon, and Amalek? Yeah, so that'd be, yeah. Well, that would be, okay. So, well, Eglon's king of Moab. So um, I don't, I, I would just put that with the Moabites, but it would be, um, so I would put Moab as being that first group that I was mentioning. Okay. All and all those. But we have uh, the children of Ammon and the children of Amalek. And those would be groups within the movement that still remained afterwards. So, so we had these, these different groups, the Alabama group. Um, uh, we had Mark Bruce's group. And uh, which is, of course, kind of connected to the Alabama group to some degree and the Jamaican group. But there was these people who still really weren't different from the group that left. And they and they I would say they possessed the 2520. That was their main message. But they were really resistant to any of this light. On the 2520 on understanding Leviticus 26 as the four seven times and the periods of 70 years and uh, even though Stephen and I went to Alabama and presented this and it seemed to be well received but some of their leaders weren't there and afterward they totally undermined everything that 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 we had presented me and Michael had presented because Michael and Stephen and I had gone there in 2016 and then you're going to have that split shortly after. And that's because there was some of those leaders who were following Mark Bruce. So, so I would, I would put that into that group of errors. And, and then the answer of course is Ehud. So this two edged sword, 18 inches in length. And that's in a sense to answering to the 18 years that they served Eglon, the King of Moab. Okay, now in the chat, <clears throat> we have this, we have a statement that Hebrew word for cubit is only used here in scripture and is different from other cubits. So it's a short cubit. Yes. Okay. So elbow to the knuckles. Right. Okay. So potentially less than 18 inches, so maybe 15 inches. Hmm. Okay. Good information. <clears throat> okay. Now as we continue in 319, but he turned again 
from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. The alternate reading of the quarries was graven images. But he turned himself again from the graven images that were by Gilgal. What graven images were by Gilgal? Because is, not, is Gilgal not the area where the king of Israel had been historically selected? Now, the translators used from Joshua 4.20. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. So this was an altar that Joshua had erected by Gilgal. Yeah, but this wouldn't refer to his altar. Right. But it's given reference first in the word quarries, but then to graven images. Graven images, yeah. Something that is not according to God's way. Mm -hmm. So where, where there's this altar, which is God's, and, and Gilgal represents, um, how, how did we have it? What did we have it represent in chapter two? Where you have this, uh, uh, the angel of the Lord going from Gilgal to Bochim, to the weepers. So you have it mentioned again. So what does that mean if we have graven images in Gilgal? That an improper method of worship has been accepted? Well, but more specifically, <laughs> you would say that the message that came from Gilgal of the weeping and the crying, right? Those that are searching for truth. Altars have been set up there. So he's going to see these altars, or not altars, but... Uh, graven images there where God's altar was. So, so he can see this perversion of truth happening. He can see this acceptance of the selfish attitudes. Yeah. And um, so he's going to turn himself again. That word's uh, uh, shuv. That Hebrew word that um, I always find quite interesting. Uh, so he turned himself again from the quarry. So he turns away from these uh, graven images. Right. That were by Gilgal. Right. So that they're in this place. And said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. So. He turns away from here, so he's going, turning away from these graven images to give this errand to the king. Now, um, now, this idea of secret, um, it's, it's kind of an interesting word. Um, oops, I'll go here. A covering, a shelter, a hiding place. A hiding place, a shelter, a secret place. Um, so it's from to hide, literally or figuratively. Um, to keep close, conceal, hide, keep secret. And, and Aaron there just means word. Right, so a secret word. So he has this word, he says, for the king. So to understand what this would be, something that's hidden. So we have this secret errand. And the king tells him to keep silence. 
Yes. So he's going to, well, he's not telling him to keep silence. Well, yes. I mean, he's not going to tell him the message. He has to send everybody out from the room before he's going to receive this message. Right. right. So I guess, yeah, that's what you mean. Right. <clears throat> and all that stood by him, all that stood by the king, went out from the king. Yeah. So all of the king's attendants, all of those that the king had surrounded himself with, all of his servants, were then sent out. Mm -hmm. And Ahud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, or a parlor of cooling, which he had for himself alone. And Ahud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. Okay, well, let's, let's go back. You're moving too fast for me. Okay. <laughs> really? I'm moving too fast for you. Yeah, well, there's, we're, we're missing things here. Okay. So the first one is when we go back, we have this dagger that's made. Now, the, this dagger's well, it says a cubit in length, but it can actually be a half cubit. Um, and that is the measure between a cubit and a span. So, so you have a cubit in a uh, between a cubit and a span. I would I'm not sure what they mean by that, but a half cubit, the measure between a cubit and a span. So nine inches, they say here. So a half cubit. And so that's interesting because that what what would the half represent? What would it have? Sorry, Stephen, go ahead. Like midway, midway, maybe? Yeah, midway, right? So so that's midnight. But and, and so it represents a chiasm again. So we have all these different representations. And then it's interesting because um, it says in 17, he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the graven images that were by Gilgal. So what does this mean he turned again from the quarries? So that means he went, he brought the present, he sent away, but he then returns when they go, when they come to these graven images by Gilgal. Is that what being said there? Am, am I understanding the narrative correctly? Well, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of, of what you're asking. Yeah. We know that Ahud has turned away from any kind of graven images. Yeah, so but just in, yeah, but just in the narrative itself. Yes. Yeah. That. Eglon has turned from these graven images? No, no, no. Uh, uh, Ehud, right? So what it's saying is that Ehud comes, he presents a present. Now it says the present, but it would just be a present to the king of Moab. And, and then uh, Eglon's going to send these people away, right? He sent away the people that bear the present. Okay. And then, but it says, but he himself turned again from the graven images that were by Gilgal. This is Ehud. So he's going to be sent away. But when he comes to Gilgal and he sees this graven images, he's going to turn back and then go to the king with this secret word or this hidden word. 
Is, is that what the narrative is saying? Is that's what I'm trying to understand? I have a, a definition of this year present as being like a, an admittance offering. Yeah, the min, mincha. So it's like a sacrificial offering. You're saying it's an admittance offering? Yes, just to greet the king. Yeah, and this is really, really common idea. So you want to have a conversation with the king, you can bring a present. You would bring a present. You wouldn't actually go to see the king without a present. So they they bring this present. Then they go away. And then we're going to see Ehud turn back again. At least that's the way that I read it. All right. <clears throat> so we have Ehud bringing a gift to the king. With, with a group of other people. But all that stood before him went out from him. The how would Ehud have people that stood before him? Well, this is the king. All that stood before the king went out from before Ehud. Not or is king. this all that stood before the king went out from the king? Yeah. So the king, um, because the king said, keep silence. And all who stood before the king went out from him, the king. Okay. Right? So this is just, I know it's Hebrew is difficult when they use the personal pronouns, but they don't do it the same as in English. But um, so, so the him is referring to the king here. Okay. So in other words, but he himself turned again. That's Ehud. Okay. So Ehud turned again from the graven images that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. Right. So he's traveling after they were sent out. They come to Gilgal. He turns around and then he goes back to the king and says, I have a secret errand. Okay. And the king tells Ehud to keep silence. Yeah. And, and he sends all the other people away. Okay. So Ehud is then brought into this summer parlor, which Eglon had to himself alone. Mm-hmm. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his supplied word seat. Now, is Ehud arising or is the king arising? The king. <clears throat> So the reason I would almost think it was Ehud is does not the arising give a symbol of a change of dispensation? Except only the king would be sitting. Okay. So only the king would be sitting. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, Amos 3.15 is used by the translators. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. So this is going to be a situation where we're, we're being shown the ending of the reign of Eglon. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a close of a message or the beginning of a message. Well, it's, I don't think it's a close of a message. I think it's the beginning of a message. And this is a message that, yeah, is, um, you know, addressing the issue, which is the seven times. Okay. So, yeah. And Ahud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Now, if you've ever considered if the dagger was on the right thigh, this would be a real interesting maneuver. Yeah, well, this is actually normally what you would do. So if you're right-handed, you put you put the dagger in your left thigh. If you're left-handed, you put it in your right thigh. So you draw your you draw it from across your body. Right. That's normally how it's done. So that's what he did. Okay. Yeah. Now the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that Ehud could not draw the dagger out of Eglon's belly, and the dirt came out. Or it came out at the fundament. So in other words, the way that this dagger goes into Eglon, it pierces through the bowels. Yeah. What message would there be that pierces through the bowels of a church? Maybe three angels, maybe. <laughs> that makes me think of uh, um, the honey to the lips and then the bitterness in the belly. Okay. What else do we have? When we're looking at this portion, where it says, and the dirt came out, or it came out at the fundament. What are, what's trying to be said here in the Hebrew? Well, it's just, yeah, the, his guts came out, all the stuff inside of him, the refuse. Then Ahud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. Was this a message of judgment? Was this a complete message of judgment? 
Okay, so, well, one thing that we, we notice here that happens quite a bit, and I mean, this is a pretty common Hebrew word, the word yat, yatsa. Okay. Um, now, yatsa is, um, it means to go forth, like the going forth of the commandment, or when Israel came out of, of Egypt, um, it could be brought forth. There's different forms of it. Um, uh, so, so it's a pretty common word. You know, so it's not like, you know, we're, um, it's, it exists, well, for 1,489 times in the Bible. So, um, so it's not, it's not like it's, it's odd that it's here, but I always associate this with, um, uh, the 70 weeks, you know, if it's in the right context here. So the understanding of the 70 week prophecy. And, you know, you'll see that he, um, uh, you know, the dirt came out. Um, he went forth. That's the same word. Um, so it can be translated various ways, um, but it's mentioned even earlier. Um, so you, you see this word quite a bit in this, this passage. So, so I, I somehow associate this then with the, and oh, and the, the word porch, uh, that's like a colonnade or an internal portico from its rows of pillars, right? So he's going to go through this colonnade, a row of pillars. And then we also have a shut door, which I think is quite interesting. Right. And... And and then, of course, there's some other words, locked, which just means to shut up. And he's going to shut up this, this stairway or, or lofty area. So maybe an upper chamber or something like that. And then it says when he was gone out. So, again, that's Yatsa. His servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked or shut. They said, surely he covereth his feet, etc. So, um, so you have Ehud with this sword, which is a half cubit, we will say, and he attacks this message, this false message. And there's, there ends up being a shut door, a close of probation in connection with that, to that message. To those that accept that message, right, and, and then you have um, him passing out when he shuts the door past the pillars. So those pillars then would represent the truths of Adventism and other things. But uh, does that make sense? Well, the you know the kind of an application that I was making here historically would be the shut door that occurred in the Millerite time. Now we have the premise that we would need to see a shut door within the movement. Yeah. So the shut door that I know we do have is November 9th. Right. 2019. And, and that is a cumulative rejection of light that brings about that shut door. And those people had many of the people on that, who lost, who closed their probation, let's say, at least in, in a symbolic sense, with November 9th, had actually embraced a lot of the light regarding chronology uh, to some degree, not all of them, but some of them, uh, yet they ended up rejecting it. And, and so you have here this close of probation. So I, I would think that part of this is connected also to the July 18th understanding because that's kind of what um, people ended up rejecting the, the July 18th understanding ended up on that side of the people who closed their probation. So it was connected, you know, as we saw with August 29th, 2019.
I mean, are we trying to make this, I mean, am I trying to, to make this too specific? I think we're going to have to examine specific and uh, general portions of this in order to properly consider what this passage is saying to us. It just seems to fit. Oh, so. man. Yeah. But it seems to fit so well. Well, <clears throat> I think we have a lot to look at here in different aspects of what this is saying. You're making the case for the specific. Yeah. Now, he was gone out. His servants came. Mm -hmm. And when they saw that, behold, the door of the parlor were locked. So yeah. when... That door... Okay, when Ehud was gone out, Eglon's servants came. Mm -hmm. And when Eglon's servants saw that, behold, the door of the parlor were locked, they said, surely he doeth his easement, or he covereth his feet in the summer chamber. Why was it important that, that he would cover his feet? in this cooling parlor. Well, covering your feet here, this would be referring to going to the washroom. Going, doing what? Going to the washroom. Okay. So going to the loo, the water closet. Yeah. Okay. So In other words, surely he's relieving himself in the summer chamber. Yeah. So, 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 and then they tarried till they were ashamed. So, I mean, this to me seems pretty clear. Who tarried till they were ashamed? The servants. Yeah, but I mean, in our movement. Talking about tarrying time. After July, yeah, no, so after July 18th? Well, if, okay, we, we would see that the, the church was tarried until they were ashamed because they didn't present this message that, that was presented on July 18th. Yeah, but this so, is after July 18th. So you have this message of July 18th, which brings about the death of Eglon, right? But then you have these servants, they're tarrying, right? They're waiting after July 18th. Does that not give the, reference to December 6th? Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's they tarried till they were ashamed. So they held on for a while, right? But then they're finally going to be ashamed. And behold, he opened not the door of the parlor. He being Eglon. Yeah. Therefore, they took a key and opened them, the doors. Yeah. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. So there's a, a people of, in this movement who really were followers of Eglon, that is, of this message. So even though they, they had this message of July 18th, presented to them they really didn't like the message of july 18th and after july 18th there's this tearing time and they're going to still profess to believe this message until they fully reject it on december 6th okay i mean can other people see what what i'm seeing or am i just forcing uh, an interpretation upon this. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, it just seems like it fits right in place. It seems to line up with that. So, in keeping in this line, mm -hmm. an Ahud escaped while they tarried. 
Mm-hmm. Ehud was not in the hands of Eglon's servants. Yes, and, and Ehud, of course, is still a message. So that message still survived. And passed beyond the graven images and escaped into Sirath. Why is it important that he escaped into Sirath? Well, what does this represent? Well, all we know is it means roughness, but I have no no way of understanding um, what it, at least I, I, maybe somebody has here. It refers to a she-goat or a kid. That's where the word comes from. Okay. Um, so it's uh, you know, so formed as 8166. So I don't know if that means it's, it comes from there or not. I don't know what they mean by formed. I mean, maybe it's just spelled the same. It could mean shaggy. Anyway, and um, um, so it's only mentioned once, right? So, you know, we don't have a lot of information on it. What does the Hebrew word translate as? Well, that's what I'm saying. It translates as roughness or shaggy. Okay. Roughness. When we're looking at this, when when we were really beginning to delve into and fill in the portions of this on chronology that we did not understand, before July 18th, can we not say that we had a rough understanding of the importance of chronology? And that we began to see it fill out or become smoother after December 6th. Yeah. So, okay. So this is kind of interesting Um, because I don't know, (laughs) because literally this is smooth onto roughness. Uh, So the word escape means smooth. He passed beyond the quarries. And um, he he escaped, or he was it was smooth unto roughness. That's kind of a an interesting uh, juxtaposition of these two definitions. Okay. Yeah, so. Um. So he passed beyond these graven images. And went from smooth unto roughness. In the chat, I put Jacob was smooth. Esau was known as a shaggy, hairy man. Goat is a sacrificial animal, but the scapegoat was led, led into the wilderness. Which is just thoughts coming to me. So, are we choosing the Jacob or are we choosing Esau? Like, are we choosing truth no. or are we choosing falsehood? I, I don't know that I would agree with that. I would ask the question, I I would have to ask the question this way. What was the garment of the prophets? How was it described? Well, it was woolly, rough. Camel's hair. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, in this situation, if we are going from smooth to rough, are we not going from the accepted manner of garment of character to the rough that the prophet would have used interesting thought very i mean that's that's how i would look at this as going from smooth to rough because many and of also have, the <clears throat> sorry, Dwight, the then, words of the prophet are rough words to those who don't want to receive them, where they would prefer you prophesy smooth things, like speak unto us deceits. Right. Or even even easy things to understand. Right. 
I've heard that in the movement quite a bit. The chronology is too hard. It's too hard for to. Well, I am one of the dullest students. I mean, the Lord is showing me things. It's showing me the value of it because I persisted. I said, Lord, if this is of you, you're going to have to open my brain. <laughs> What if, what if the situation here is that this message brings forth a people that have come from the smooth into the rough and they are being prepared to give a message that many may not want to hear? But yet is an important message to be heard. Yeah. So, and I'm not really sure that this um, word there that they translate as a place, I, I don't think it's actually a place. I, I think this is a Hebrew idiom. Okay. This ex from smooth to roughness. So how would that be accepted then? How, how could this idiom be applied? Well, so I don't know. It's just, it doesn't seem to me to make much sense that you're going to have these two words, smooth and roughness, together at some place that, that nobody knows where it is. It's never mentioned anywhere else. Um, you know, unless it's, unless, you know, I don't know. I, I just say, you know, it's it's just an unknown idiom or expression. But while they tarried, he, and Ehud escaped while they tarried, he passed beyond the graven images in Gilgal. And he went from smooth to roughness. I mean, I mean, even then it could just refer to his journey going from uh, an easy part of the journey to a more difficult part of the journey. I just don't I just don't think it it's likely that it's a place. But you know, I could be wrong. Sort of uh, a few suggestions uh, mentioned it being in Southeast Ephraim. Yeah, well that's just and that's because of this story, because he's going to blow this trumpet in Mount Ephraim. So um, at least in anything I've read. They don't seem to know where it is, other than just a guess. But um, maybe maybe it is a place. I'm just I haven't found anything that you know. It's related to the word seer, um, but see, it's in a feminine form. Right, that's why the ath at the end. So if it's in the feminine form, is this not something in relation to the movement or church? I don't know that. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta research this a little bit more. I don't know enough about it. Okay. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. The trumpet is blown for an assembly. He's not calling them to war. He's calling them to assemble. And he's blowing this in the mountain of Ephraim. Well, it's a, so it's a message to northern Israel. Usually Ephraim. Okay. But the mountain of Ephraim, is this not government? From the chat, going back to our, our conversation about rough, Hebrews 11, 
36 to 35, sufferings of God's messengers, rough places. So if we're assembling here, he blew a trumpet and we are given out of Ephraim, was there a root of them against Amalek? After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. That's Judges 5.14. Then we have Judges 6.34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abizer was gathered after him. And then again, 1 Samuel 13 to 3. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Again, he's calling for an assembly. Now this with Mount Ephraim, we would have Joshua 17, 15. And Joshua answered them, if thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Now get in sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Hara or Beth Bara and Jordan. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Judges 17, one, closing chapters of this book. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And Judges 19, 1, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. All of these things are being tied back in. And we're seeing that this trumpet is being blown in Mount Ephraim. Your point is that this would be northern Israel. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's, a message, it's a message for northern Israel. Okay. So that would be the United States. Did we blow a trumpet in Mount Ephraim with uh, the article in the Tennessean? Yes. Yeah. Did we give a message not only to the United States, but to the church in general at that time? Yes. Yeah, and, and this is 327. So that's also symbolic of March 27th, the symbol of the message to the Levites. Now, if we if we were to reverse those numbers, would it also not be 723, two days yeah. after midnight? Well, yeah, well, 723 is not doesn't really represent two days after midnight, but uh, it is a symbol. Uh, July, uh, September uh, uh, 23rd, which is the date in 2017 when I first presented July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Okay. So, so that's why the 327, the 723, and the 273 all combined together. But, but yeah, so this has, this trumpet would have to be that trumpet of warning for what was coming upon Nashville and the United States. Okay. Now we're coming to the close of our time today. Mm -hmm. We have some additional research to do on this portion of the book of Judges to then go forward. 
Are there any other thoughts or comments at this time? A uh, quick question, Dwight. Did you send out the, uh, did you send out chapter three of your notes? I can. Oh, okay. So you didn't, because I looked through my stuff. I see, I got one and two, but I don't have three. I, yeah. I thought, okay. Thank you. I appreciate can, that. Yeah, he'll send it out to me and then I'll send it to everyone. Because um, I'm going to have to do the, my weekly email with notes and stuff. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, there are many, many points that we need to consider with this example that you are giving in the book of Judges. Help us to understand the role of Ehud. Help us to understand the message that is to be given at this time. I thank you, Father, for each one that has participated today. I ask, Father, for your blessing upon all. Direct us now guide us so that as we walk, we may consider these messages that are to be presented, that we may also consider our great need of you and of your character, your robe of righteousness. Be with us now throughout this day until we meet again. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.